Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I am your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I am joined by my esteemed co-host, Ricardo Martinez. Uh, and today, uh, both myself and Ricardo are interviewing Nicholas Gregory, a man with many talents, uh, as you can see from his Twitter bio, uh, and the man behind Commerce Block. Uh, so how are you doing today, Nicholas? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Nice. Well, we're super, super happy to, to have you here. Uh, and today, I guess I want to start off with a question uh, just to get an idea of, uh, you know, the man behind it all. Uh, I, I, I saw because I was I was listening, I think it was last week to a podcast of yours that's fairly recent with Stefan Rivera. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you were talking at the beginning about like your work as a software engineer. Uh, but I also saw, because I was, I was looking, you know, uh, at different websites and Twitter and things, and I saw that you were a martial arts coach and diver as well, which sounds pretty exciting. Um, but I was thinking to myself, like, hey, how how is that? Because obviously software engineer, martial arts guy and diver, like three pretty different spheres. So I was, I was wondering, I don't know, if you could like give me a bit of an understanding of the story of like how those worlds blended together and, and kind of how you ended up doing all those different things. It just sounded like an interesting story to me. Well... <clears throat> If you watch The Matrix, which I'm sure you've heard of, there's quite a few parallels between being a software engineer and a martial artist. So, but yeah, <laughs> I was just a hobbyist. You know, when I was young, I used to travel a bit. I used to work a bit, backpack. Um, I got into martial arts really just because it was a way of training with other people and staying fit. I was never into uh, just going to a gym and lifting something. And it, it was really a different avenue of meeting people. And it just so happened I am, um, I did it for quite a while and then I, I moved to New York through work in 2010 and you know I just ended up teaching there because the, the, the thing that the, the type I was doing wasn't well known in the US and it was really just a hobby and it was a great way to, to meet people in the US like outside of like you know the kind of software engineering work sphere and that's it really to be honest but I, I guess I did a, a reality TV show once or I think some YouTube thing in New York and it kind of blew up there was this uh, Irish boxer who went around the US challenging, I guess, Kung Fu people. And I didn't take it seriously at the time. I said, yeah, let's meet. And before I knew it, I was on the YouTube show and he became a good friend. And yeah, I guess I, through that, I started teaching quite a lot. But it's 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 just a, a bit of fun. I mean, I don't teach anything anymore. I mean, I do for fun. I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But you know, that's just as a hobbyist. You know, keeps me sane, keeps me in shape. And that's, that's it, really. <laughs> Sorry, nothing more... Uh, Nothing more special than that. Well, no, I'd, I'd say, I don't know, it sounds kind of interesting and like unexciting to a degree. So like, obviously, because you, you, you said, is it BJJ that you were into at the time? And then when you no, went not to- Not at the time, I no. am now. So, you know, right. <clears throat> MMA is big now, but then it was kind of transitioning. And then yeah, just through people I knew, I started going to MMA schools. And I really, recently, I really fall for BJJ. I like it. And I'm getting a bit older. So at a certain point in life, you can't get punched in the head anymore, you know, can punch and hurt. <laughs> especially if you're a software engineer, you need to think. Jiu-Jitsu, I'm not saying Jiu-Jitsu is not tough, it, it is obviously, but you can train at a high level without, you know, getting concussion. You can always tap. So if someone's trying to choke you, if someone's trying to pull your arm out of your shoulder, you can always tap. So it's a great way to train, I think, as you get older without risking concussion and injuries, because you can tap. I mean. I still get injured in jiu-jitsu, but you know, it's normally because I haven't tapped quick enough or I haven't warmed up. It's, I don't have to worry about you know, teeth. Well, you can have your teeth knocked out, but I don't have to worry about blows to the head and things like that. But yeah, that's that's probably why I describe jiu-jitsu for me. I get that. It's uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying because I think from like uh, my understanding, I've got friends who do uh, jujitsu and, and and other martial arts, and they were saying like um, it's like if you're a smaller person, you can use like a, a different vantage points and grapples and things to like avoid getting into rough situations. And yeah, they were saying you avoid a lot more unnecessary combat. I guess is the way they put it. So, well, there's, there's no strikes in jujitsu. So, mm. and if you look at the original UFC days, it's, it was weird. You had these kind of boxers, kickboxers, fighting these little jiu-jitsu guys who essentially just drag these guys to the ground and using leverage would pop their shoulder or, you know, try and choke them from the behind. And, you know, it's, it's, it is very engineering-like. So, you know, you know, if you Google jiu-jitsu, you will see a lot of big, you know, strong guys wrestling. Very scientific. It's very engineering. It's all about leverage. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of Bitcoiners are in it, funny enough. Um, the place I used to train in New York, um, Roger Baird used to have private lessons there. And uh, it was funny because... Um, he used to pay private lessons in Bitcoin 
And I never met him, but one day I was in the showers, as you do, with one of the coaches, and he was complaining about some Bitcoin guy who uh, screwed him, more or less, by paying for class in, in Bitcoin. And he didn't realize that this was probably 2015. He didn't realize how much that money actually was. So he literally, he knew I was working in tech. He knew I knew about Bitcoin. So he literally went on his uh, blockchain.com account. And I think his password was probably something like password or one, two, three. And then it turns out Roger Ver paid almost $30,000 for a lesson and the money was there. And suddenly this black, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt was like, wow, <laughs> couldn't believe it. So, so, you know, I think he was angry for a few years and ultimately was very happy. And this yeah. was in 2015, so I guess that's probably $400,000 now. So. Damn, that's that's amazing. Actually, that's kind of a cool story. Like, if a, if the jujitsu guy had like diamond hands, you know, he'd uh, he'd be sat there with you know potentially half a million or something. Quite a bit, he still uh, has right half now. of it. He he blew half of it on a surfing holiday, and uh, he still has. I still speak to him about that. So. <laughs> that's really cool. That's uh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I didn't realize um, the connection. I guess yeah, as you said, Roger Burns. I suppose. Um, yeah, I suppose basically what you're saying is you're basically Neo, really. I mean, you, you made it at the, <laughs> the beginning of the, the, beginning of the podcast. Yeah, when, when, I, when I close my eyes and sleep, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, no, I like it. It's, um, I mean, I, 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 I'll move on slightly because I know I'm where the, you know, our audience isn't, isn't uh, uh, fighting and martial arts based. But uh, it's just, I think it's really interesting just to, to understand that. And, and I guess that's a pretty cool story as well. Um, and it, it can, I, I've heard a lot of stories about people who didn't fully understand Bitcoin or whatever, being paid in it years ago or tipped in it or, or whatever. And then um, they just, you know, find out, oh, it's worth, you know, X amount. And they've made, you know, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands. I, I love those kinds of stories. It's always, yeah. uh, it's always awesome to hear that. Nicholas, I, I don't want to change the subject on you, but um, what is Mercury Wallet? Like, I'm super interested to hear about your project that you're working on. Yeah, so it's a combination of things, but essentially um, a guy called Ruben um, Samson, he wrote... Um, he wrote a white paper, well, a medium verse about a concept called state chains. And essentially it's a way of moving private keys, which uh, at the time it came out, you know, Commerce Block had been around for three years. We'd been building side chains, but um, we'd used the same code base as, as Liquid, which is called Elements, and we built permission side chains. But in, in reality, we hadn't had much traction. That wasn't going too well. But so we were looking for other things to do in Bitcoin and, you know, just, that struck a few chords. You know, I think one of the things I liked about state chains is it, at the time it solved some of the scalability issues because you could move private keys off chain, so you're not touching the Bitcoin blockchain. And you know, a, a lot of Bitcoiners always say, "Is it not your keys, not your coins?" I like the fact that this kind of <laughs> changes that a bit because now you're moving your private keys around. And um, some of his writings at the time, you know, it wouldn't have been possible to build state chains at the time because it it relied on some changes to Bitcoin, the predominantly L2. But my co-founder, you know, he worked with our team to basically come up with a way using these kind of time locks to kind of get out of that. And also at the same time, um, I think Chris Belcher started looking at the coin swap idea and uh, he, he'd written a, uh, some stuff on, on the Bitcoin mailing list. And, you know, we didn't just want to build state chains because, you know, we are a business, we are you know, we need to make money. So we thought, why not combine, you know, kind of coin swaps with state chains to provide a kind of a new privacy technique for Bitcoin. We, we've been doing bits on privacy anyway. You know, when you're working on uh, side chains, we, we've been using the elements code base, which had confidential transactions. So we've been toying about privacy anyway. And because we work with a lot of institutions, you know, believe it or not, privacy is not just for dark markets. Institutions want privacy. We want Bitcoin to be as private as the existing financial system. So we felt by, you know, kind of combining state chains and coin swaps, we'd basically provide a new privacy tool for Bitcoin, which had some, you know, scaling um, benefits because you could move Bitcoin off chain. And, you know, the, the privacy element also becomes quite cheap because you're, you're doing swaps off chain. Because at the moment, most you know, privacy techniques are quite expensive in terms of, you know, there's a lot of on-chain transactions that go on. And, which now in our world becomes state coin. We use coin swap to, you know, to basically pass them around to swap them so that you can basically lose your history or you know, transfer your history and create a kind of like a, a privacy layer. So, and you know, Mercury, which you know, we're still in beta, but you know, we released our beta for um, I think it's about six weeks now. We have some users. That's essentially what it does. It allows Bitcoin to be kind of moved into these state coins. And then in, there's a, a, a coin swap tool that allows like, people to basically meet and swap their coins. And, you know, the whole protocol is private. It's you know, the, 
the, the coin swap protocol itself is uses kind of like is blinded. Yeah, so I think, so what we do is the wallet allows um, us to take in Bitcoin and convert them into stake coins, which stake coins are essentially just the Bitcoin U UTXO. Um, so, and by using the coin swap uh, protocol, we're able to swap them blindly with other participants. So essentially as a user, you can come in, you create a stake coin by depositing some Bitcoin and essentially you go to this, you use the swap feature to basically exchange or swap your Bitcoin or stake coins with other users. Now, some of the limitations here is these, these are UTXO based, so they're fixed denominations. So you can only, you know, a stake coin will say have one Bitcoin or point one Bitcoin, it stays that. You, we can't break it, it's not divisible like Lightning. It's, it's not suited for small payments. It's essentially taking Bitcoin addresses or UTXOs and facilitating moving them off chain. So I, I guess the um, the thought that comes to mind understanding that is, um, I guess, as you say, it's not not like uh, as useful for, for for quick, small commerce, like buying a coffee or something as, as Lightning would be. Um, but then obviously Lightning has the drawback of, you know, needing lots of liquidity tied up and things like that. Um, it, what's the... I guess what's the demand and the fees when it comes to to, to utilizing um, state chains and 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 coin swaps? Yeah, so because these are UTXOs and because they're, they're, they're blinded, we can't charge for swaps anyway. So, so there is a fee when when you leave the system. So if you come in, you deposit your coins, uh, you can swap as much as you want for as long as you can. And well, when I say as long as you can, we we do have these things time locked. At the moment, we've set that to three months. So you know, but in that period, you can swap as much as you can. And then when you come out, we take a fee of 0.5%. So, but that's unlimited swaps and, you know, and you're free and that coin can be transferred. You know, every time it's transferred, I think there's a decrementing time lock. So, and the reason we've done that is there is a risk that a previous owner could basically steal your funds. However, what we did, we used this time lock sequence that can only happen after that three month period. So say, for example, um, so, you know, one of the things is, are we custodial or not? Uh, we're not custodial in that, you know, if we get shut down, there's, there's no funds that can be seized. We have no access to the funds, but there is that risk that a previous owner could basically broadcast an existing transaction and, and take the funds. And, and that, that issue exists in Lightning. I mean, a few, in, a previous owner of Lightning could do that as well. Now, Lightning, I think, solves that by having punishment transactions and watchtowers. The way we solve it is we basically set the backup transactions to have a kind of a three month limit so in that three months you're you you're you should feel it's impossible for a previous owner to steal the funds so so long as you behave stay in the state coin system for that three months that risk doesn't exist so say for example uh, mercury was to, to vanish let's just say that the, the server blows up or we get shut down you always have a backup transaction to broadcast the bitcoin network to, to take your funds but that backup transaction would only be accepted by the bitcoin network once that three month limit is, is, is eclipsed. Okay, gotcha. So I suppose um, when I'm thinking of things to compare it to, um, I, I suppose obviously it's, it's a, I'm, under, I'm right in understanding it's a layer two rather than a side chain, right? So that would be more like lightning in a way uh, than liquid. But then I feel like the competing, the competing sort of the, the use case almost is more of like competing with liquid, I would, I would say, but like maybe a more private version. I, I, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just kind of making sort of assumptions. But from what you're saying, yeah. you can understand that feels like what it is. It's like, Oh, it's somewhere sorry. in between because obviously i mean it doesn't have the liquidity inefficiency of liquid i mean there, there doesn't need to be any capital locked up but also you know you're, you're stuck with fixed denominations uh, so obviously like sorry lightning is good for micro payments but it, it's kind of very inefficient from a, a liquidity point of view i mean i wouldn't say we compete with a side chain because a side chain um i mean when it comes to custodiality you know side chain is kind of custodian i mean you are relying on the kind of like the uh, federation, the federation could, in theory, seize your funds. Also, um, all transactions are recorded on the side chain. Even if you're using confidential transactions, you do have a, uh, a ledger here. With a state chain, you know, you're not, you know, transactions are essentially blind. I mean, they happen off chain. We do record them, but, you know, these are all public. But, you know, there's no, also from a custodial point of view, we don't have custody. So, but, you know, there is an attack vector that I mentioned of the previous owners being able to steal the funds. So 
yeah, it's kind of hard to compare. I mean, there's a lot of noise on Twitter about kind of having lightning work on top of state chains, which, you know, we, we are looking at doing, but you know, I can imagine that's quite, there's a lot of complexity because essentially we're moving private keys. So to think of it, those private keys could be lightning channels. Now, obviously there's a lot of challenge there if, uh, with lightning, but a lot of people would like to see state chains merged into lightning, uh, lightning for that reason. So you could basically go from your kind of like coins, your Bitcoin to lightning kind of seamlessly via state chain. But um, yeah, we're quite well, far away from building something like that. <laughs> Nicholas, to me, it kind of sounds like Mercury functions um, in a similar way to the coordinator in Wasabi Wallet when you do the coin joins. Yeah, when we do the you, coins, you're grouped stuff. with a bunch of other people, and and um, obviously, like it's a state chain thing, so yeah. it's different than Wasabi. But like, are you mix like when you use Mercury? Do you mix with like hundreds of other people or like fifty other people, or how does Correct. that work? So we have, if you open the wallet, the first thing you do is you deposit your coins and you create your state coins, and we then we do have a swap function which works very much like a, a Wasabi coordinator. I mean, the best way I think to think of state chains or state coins is virtual open dimes. That's essentially what they are. Uh, someone coined that the other day, but you know, remember the open dimes, you know, those kind of USB sticks where you can put Bitcoin in? That's what these things are, they're virtual ones. Yeah, that's probably the best of analogy I can think of to describe it. So our coin swap is essentially putting all these uh, uh, open dimes in a jar, shaking it and pulling a different one out. That's a Excellent analogy. Thanks. That yeah. like, really helps me understand it. <laughs> yeah, I think that does. Yeah. I, I struggle to explain it because, you know, I, I work in the weeds with it all the time, so it feels normal to me. But when I explain it to people who, you know, are thinking like, you know, we're, we're basically virtual open dimes. You know, open dimes have got fixed amounts. You obviously, you can't change them. They are private keys, essentially. And, yeah, they, they live in this kind of virtual world now which is you know, what we call the Mercury wallet. With like other privacy wallets, like Wasabi, for example, they, people also want to see it like go from a coin join into lightning channels and stuff like that. So it would be super interesting um, if Mercury could also do that. That's on our roadmap. So I think we, I mean, look, there's, there's various ways we could integrate lightning. What the complex way and probably the most interesting way is that these state coins represent a lightning channel. But I think that there's a, you know, we've spoken to some of the lightning devs, that's probably a, uh, you know, a lot of engineering and we're not sure of the use case and there's a lot of complexity there. But I think in the short term, what we would like to do is when people do withdraw, uh, they could potentially withdraw to a lightning channel. That would be our first kind of integration with lightning. And I think after that, potentially we would take the fee as a lightning payment. So at the moment people deposit their coins and you know they can swap they can send them to other people and then as they once they withdraw back to bitcoin a fee is taken i think a nice feature would be to just take a lightning payment up front to basically create the state coin and then you deposit your bitcoin into it and in theory that would leave less on-chain tate potentially you know we could do things where if people pay a bit more they get more state coins and probably reduce the fees as well and i think that would for us would give us a nice opportunity to kind of integrate lightning slowly into the wallet as opposed to the, the big bang approach of having state coins represent lightning channels and Bitcoin, which you can imagine there's quite a lot of complexity there. Am I, I, I might be, I'm going to make an assumption when I ask you this question. Uh, first, actually, if you could answer just to tell me, is, is Mercury Wallet a, a commerce block product or is it a separate thing that you're doing? I just wanted to be sure of that because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't it's check built, that. Out. It's built, the code's built by commerce block. It's run as a separate entity because obviously it has its own Sure, yeah, way of operating, but it's yeah, the whole team is at Commerce Block, yeah. and it's gotcha. all we're building, it's all we're working on, yeah. So, right, gotcha, okay, understood, thanks. Now, I just wanted to be sure of that because obviously, you know, I didn't want to make the assumption blindly. Um, so I guess, like, the, the something I wanted to ask because, um, I guess what, what, what you're doing is, is, is interesting work. It's obviously passionate based work and it's obviously privacy based to a degree as well with the, with the coins swaps. Um, and so I, I know on, on Stefan's podcast, like you were talking about at the beginning again, like how you discovered Bitcoin 2013, 2014 ended up creating commerce block 2016 ish. Um, I guess what I wanted to, uh, to understand, cause I know you guys did the side chain thing first and, and now you're working what you're working on, which is Mercury wallet and, and, and state chains. Um, I wanted to understand what the, the primary goal, I guess, is for commerce block. Like you, you obviously get to this point where you decided to create the company, um, 
why i guess like what and, and what is like, how has that changed and, and what is your overall goal i guess like i want to understand the overall goal of the company and of the team and of yourself and, and the people working with you um like why you're doing this because I, I guess it's always good to understand people's why um so that you can kind of better understand what they're creating yeah i guess originally we were looking at side chains and you know we wanted to build bitcoin infrastructure based on side chains and you know there's a lot of reasons why that hasn't worked out um a lot of it has to do you know, in 2019, we, we would speak to people about building on a, on a side chain. You know, people like EOS, if you remember them, Tezos, would, with their <laughs> bags of cash, would make it more lucrative to work with others. I also think Bitcoin has changed. It's, you know, it's become a lot more ossified. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of like a hard environment to build, you know, kind of smart contracts on. And, you know, we just evolved, and, you, know, you know, the team, you know, one of my colleagues are mainly Bitcoin guys. They know they know the infrastructure quite well. They know the Bitcoin scripting language quite well. And I think privacy was where I thought it was interesting. And, and, and we were doing privacy stuff on side chains anyway. And you know, you know, when I saw the state state chain idea, it just felt very logical. There was a gap in the market. Yeah, you know, privacy is quite hard on Bitcoin. That's be clear. You know, Wasabi is not for everyone. Samurai is not for everyone. Join market is certainly not for everyone. I mean, join market is really interesting, but it's it's I wouldn't be able to show it to my mother, put it that way. So we thought, you know, if you look at the Mercury wallet, we hope we've created a wallet that's slightly easier to use than some of the other things. I mean, you know, I'm not, you know, there's a lot of myths about privacy. Probably people sometimes think privacy is a dark thing, but I just want Bitcoin to be as private as PayPal. <laughs> it's impossible for me to see your PayPal account. It should be the same. And I think a lot of people these days that I know don't even use Bitcoin because they, they don't really want to show their whole history when they go buy something with it. It's, it's, not, it's not ideal in that sense. And I think, and you know, funny, when I speak to institutions, which I do, because you know, I, I was a software engineer for banks. I worked on the trading floor. They, they're concerned about the privacy of Bitcoin. You know, they don't like the idea that Bitcoin sometimes is, is, is an open book. You know, you can see big trade flows or going in from exchanges to certain addresses. There are websites out there that can detect, you know, this address belongs to this guy or that belongs to that hedge fund or whatever. So I do think privacy is needed. Uh, have you received any criticism from like the Bitcoin uh, maximalists and stuff like that on Twitter? Because uh, you guys are basically creating like a colored coin or something with, with Bitcoin, like the state coins. No, not, not at all. I mean, you know, you always expect some banter on Twitter, but no, not at all. I mean, we haven't really created a colored coin. I mean, all we're doing is moving private keys around. So we've, we've taken Bitcoin as it is, which has been a challenge. You know, there's, you know, I think everyone, everyone agrees that it's hard to build on Bitcoin. That's what it, it is. Just, it is. It, the, the, the code base is hard. So, you know, I think where we've received uh, criticism, and you, you, that's to be expected, is how non-custodial we are. And, you know, I think we've tried to, we haven't tried to say we are, we're not. I mean, I believe we're not, but we've tried to be as upfront about how we're non-custodial. So uh, in our back end, the way it works is every time a stake coin is created, we on the back end have to create a private key. So um, we created, um, we actually open sourced it. So it's called Lockbox. We basically built our own HSM based on Intel SGX. And that basically creates a private key per stake coin. And when people remove their state coin or take it out or you know take it out of circulation we use the, our hsm to prove that we've deleted it and you know this is licensed by intel and we're quite upfront about how it works and you know so if people feel there's a risk in using us they can they can see what we've done so i think i think someone came up with the term it might have been ruben sansa but we're provable non-custodian or something like that we're not there's there is a risk that a previous owner could steal the funds but then if that happened you would know it was us that was behaving maliciously and you know we'd have to do it up front so if we decided to steal all the money right now we could it's just it's impossible we don't have those private keys and they get deleted and if someone wants to break our private key the one we have in the end that would be quite useless but if we were to suddenly become malicious and work with a previous owner because of the way the protocol works you would know it's us that's behaving malicious so there's quite, and we'd also have to um, work with Intel to uh, to prove to, to basically break the me the mechanism because we're using Intel SGX. So you know, I don't think they would be. I think that's probably kind of unlikely. But you know, there's always trade-offs and pluses. So yeah, we're quite open about the trade-offs we have. 
and yeah, we're hoping people will build on what we've done, you know, because, you know, yeah, it's unlikely that Bitcoin's going to change in the next few years. So if we're to advance the protocol, we have to accept some of its limitations and build build around it. So we we because we we spoken with the. Um with wasabi wallet guys and 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 gibson from condoin and we've spoken with um with liquid as well um i guess on on the on the coin join side of things i think from from my understanding from speaking with a couple of the guys at wasabi and that their their like primary view or vision for the future would be everyone by default utilizing coin join um and it actually becoming cheaper than um they're not utilizing coin join when it comes to transactions so it becomes cheaper and it becomes more private that's their kind of future dream or goal i get would you say that for yourselves your future dream or goal would be like wallets by default uh utilizing um state chains and utilizing the coin swap feature and like people by default you know having it as an option within most of the top wallets and and kind of it becoming the norm is that kind of what you would, is that kind of the, the goal that you think you, you want to go for? Like you, you think other companies well, the, the, would help? Well, first with? of all, there's a, privacy via coin swaps and coin joins are very different. So yeah, when, when you do a coin join, you essentially on the Bitcoin blockchain, you have this one Uber transaction and basically your history is kind of merged into that one transaction. Now the challenge there is, you know, exchanges can just say, well, you've participated in the coin join, your money is useless. So you do have this issue that with coin joins, you could create these, you know, two tiers of Bitcoin, you've got, you know, nice, clean KYC, <laughs> OFAC compliant Bitcoin and, you know, coin join. And we don't do coin joins, we do coin swaps. Now, coin swaps don't create an uber massive transaction. They essentially swap the history. So if all, you know, if me and you and say a North Korean person was to swap history, one of us may end up with that dirty coin. So the benefit is that it's, you know, it's harder for, um, exchanges etc to pick up a coin swap but someone could end up with that dirty coin now what we do is we basically take a hash you know we basically attest every coin swap we've done into the bitcoin blockchain using something called mainstay which is a protocol we wrote which is very similar to open timestamp so if a coin swap was to happen and you ended up with the dirty coin you could say well i'm not a north korean dude <laughs> i uh, i did a coin swap on this day and i can prove it on the bitcoin blockchain and honestly, because coin swaps is quite new, we don't know how challenges are going to react to it. Are they? And, and there is always that risk you end up with a dirty coin, but I would say the risk is minimal. And you can always then do a coin join afterwards or put it through a lightning channel. But um, so I think there's some, you know, to say that coin join or coin swap is one is better, they're different. They're, there's different risks in both. But do I see all coins being coin joined or coin swapped? I don't know. <laughs> It's, it's, it's quite hard to tell right now. And, you know, you're always playing this kind of cat and mouse games with you know, the exchanges, the chain analysis of the world. And Lightning's only going to make that even more messy, which is a good thing, to be honest, because you want to make their jobs happy. And funny, I have spoken to the chain analysis guys, and they want us to be doing this privacy stuff. You know, in a way, it kind of keeps them, in, keeps them busy anyway. So it's kind of like a game you're playing, which is, I think, it's one of the fun stuff around Bitcoin, you know, kind of playing this game of like cat and mouse is, is fun. I think Nicole's already answered my question I was going to ask anyway, which is um, how resilient is um, Mercury, you know, against um, coin, um, um, coin tracking firms like Channel Analysis and the, and the likes. So is it, uh, do, do, are, are, you know, users of Mercury wallet, you know, do they have full confidence of, you know, Mercury that they are, you know, fully covered or like you explained, there are some risks or can you, you know, is there any more that you can explain? Well, I think if I'm 100% honest, I, we're not big enough for chain analysis to even pay attention to us. But I think once they start looking at us, then it, you know, that will be a challenge and it's going to be work in progress. So at the moment, there's no on-chain paint of a, it's impossible to see that a, a coin swap happened, but we do take a fee. So chain analysis could look for that fee we take. And that's why we're looking at a lightning payment to basically take that up front so there wouldn't be a fee. So if people were to come to our wallet and basically buy the stake coins, which essentially be like buying an empty open dime, that would happen off chain. It could happen with a, a lightning payment. And then once they put their Bitcoin in there and do swaps and then come out, I think that's going to be very hard for chain analysis firm to detect. I think the only thing they would be able to see is that we have fixed nominations. But 
exchanges and chain analysis firms going to penalize everyone who has a, a 0 0.001 fixed nomination? I mean, and also we can always start changing up the denominations. We can have um, 0 0.123 or something, which I think some of the coin swap uh, coin join people are already looking at doing. So I think once we take lightning payments up front, we essentially would have no one chain tape. That's my feeling at the moment. And uh, I, I hope, I mean, I'll be honest, I hope we become big enough where we are a problem for chain analysis and then we, we can readjust and, and, and play the game. Yeah, so. yeah I, I think like uh, that's you know, one of the biggest challenges of people actually adopt it. I think, like, I think there are two reasons why people refuse to you know, be more yeah. you know, privacy oriented, which is one, they do not, you know, they do not care, they do not give a shit about privacy. They're free to, you know, hand over all their details to whoever, you know, whatever big corporation asks of it. And second is that um, it's the complexity of using, you know, privacy enhancing tools. Like um, at, at the moment, I don't think there is any um, mobile friendly um, service wallet for, you know, plebs like me um, who well, want okay, to, you know, so we, we yeah. I mean, we we spend a lot of time. I mean, we didn't design the UI because if my team designed the UI, it looked like Electrum, which as you know, is not easy to use. But um, so we did get like an external the UI designer. But what and you know, I think the UI is good. But one of the issues we found and something we need to improve on is a lot of people times people think our servers down, and um, we find out it's not down. It's just Tor is being Tor. Tor could be DMD. DOS Tor is running slow. So we're going to make some enhancements to actually show to the user look, you know, the wallet's not down, the funds are safe, it's just tours running slow. And yeah, I think making things like that more verbose would help. I, I do think Samurai runs, runs on a mobile phone, but I, I'm not sure on that. I think it's Android based. Although yeah. I think, yeah. But yeah, yeah I think, but it's pretty complex. I tried, I tried using it a couple of times and it's, it's, you know, does my head in. I'm like, uh, I just give up. You know halfway and um and i i i guess this is i'm and i'm pretty i'm one of those people that you know i'm i'm not totally you know newbie when it comes to using stuff like this but it's that hard when someone like me who is who you know talk, wants to be who wants to go private but finds it difficult to use it so it's like samurai even as friendly you know user friendly as they claim it is but this is where this is the current state it is in right now so i i'd yeah, be interested in your feedback on mercury because we did we, you know, we did try and make a big, nice React-based wallet. Made it, for, and we, we've got a demo video on our Twitter handle, which if you, I'd be curious because we, we, we did try a hard to make it user-friendly. Because the first time I used Wasabi, I struggled, <laughs> and I'm a, <laughs> and you know, and it was nothing against Wasabi. It's just a very complicated thing to do, and then you know, the wallets jam, and I probably was critical of Wasabi, but having built a privacy wallet, now I totally get why privacy while it's jam it's probably 99 percent of the time it's it's tour jamming yeah so i mean and that, that's what we've tried to do um yeah i think the problem with us is this concept of moving private keys a lot of people it's like quite weird and you know we, we but so far i think people have found it quite easy to use but again you know we've we're in beta we're still ironing out little bugs i think the tour issue for us is the biggest challenge it's like if the wallet freezes up you know, you haven't lost your coins. It's not that the server's down. It's because Tor, and and we're looking at doing alternatives to Tor, like using like more maybe more reliable protocols like I2P, etc. Maybe giving people the option to switch. But I think yeah, it's it's one of the um, our initial users, which was from Ruben Samson's group. He basically created the state chain torch, and you know, if you go on Twitter, you see people being passing around a bit like lightning torch, and it's been very interesting to see different people use it, you know, people from whose, whose English is not their first language, people that have never used a Bitcoin wallet. And it's been quite good feedback in terms of, and I think people find the wallet easy to use, but maybe we haven't been giving enough tool tips, enough uh, explanations of like why this is so, but yeah, that's, that's, that's our job to do, I guess. But yeah, it seems to be, it's definitely much easier to use. In the last six weeks, I think we've improved it a lot. I think people are finding it easier to swap. And, you know, people like the fact that you're not penalized if you screw up a swap, you know, they are free. We have this feature where you can just leave it in auto swap throughout the day. So we've tried to make that as simple as possible. So I, I, yeah, but I, I agree with you. I mean, privacy does, does need to be improved and I think maybe other protocols do that slightly better than us. So 
you know, and I did look at, you know, I'm, I'm quite open-minded. I did look at the way, say, for example, tornado swap works on Ethereum. And, you know, whether you like Ethereum or not, that's another question, but, you know, it, it does make privacy quite easy. And we've, you know, looked at a few of those concepts and put that into Mercury Wallet. Something that's, um, that I always think is an interesting question to ask, and we get a lot of different answers, because Bitcoin privacy is a very difficult thing to work on. It's a very complex and difficult thing to get right and because it's not baked in at the base layer right uh we're often talking to you know super intelligent people who are trying their best to create user-friendly solutions uh to make it easy which is very hard mm -hmm. as you definitely will have experienced and are experiencing mm -hmm. so i the question comes is you know what a why why decide to work on bitcoin privacy um when there are different uh, cryptocurrencies out there that uh, you know have privacy sort of baked in at the the base layer like monero for example what what is it that uh for you wasn't you know wasn't right uh, or, or meant that you didn't want to put your time into or you know what did you see as an issue with things like monero and zcash and other things that have sort of privacy baked in um why is it that you decided to go for uh, creating sort of privacy solutions for bitcoin uh, instead well, I think there's always trade-offs. So, you know, Bitcoin, you know, doesn't have privacy at the base layer, but the benefit is auditability. You know, I, you know, I, I like Monero. I studied it quite a lot, but we don't know if there's an inflation bug there. And, you know, I think, the, you know, the people who designed Bitcoin originally, they, they made the right trade-offs in, in putting privacy as a second layer. But, you know, I think if Bitcoin is to be more usable, and, you know, privacy is not just... I, I speak to a lot of institutions who want privacy in Bitcoin as well. You know, this is, you know, when Liquid came out, you know, a lot of institutions were looking at it as a settlement layer using confidential transactions. So I think it's one of the, the holes in Bitcoin that needs to be answered. And a lot of people will be satisfied with just using Lightning. I mean, Lightning is fairly private. I think the issue with Lightning, I think, is we just don't, you know, if, if there's only one or two lightning hubs in the world, maybe it's not going to be that private, but at the moment, if you have a quite a big decentralized network, it probably will be. And I also thought, you know, the state chains idea kind of gives you a bit of scalability. I mean, I think moving chains off, I, there's a lot of use cases that I think are going to come out of state chains that we haven't thought about, but having this virtual open dime, I, I found it quite fascinating. And, and to be frank, I, what is, if you're like Bitcoin, what are the interesting things to build? I mean, Lightning's going in a good direction. I mean, we built side chains. That's without knocking other people that are still working on that. That hasn't really taken the world by storm. And you know, if you look at the privacy stuff, it's interesting. It's it's moving. People are people are using Wasabi, Samurai, and Join Market. If you go to a BitcoinKPIs.com, there's significant volume. It shows that there is a demand for that. And I think now there's a demand to make that easier to use. Gotcha. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, uh, to conclude, I suppose the answer, the big, the big points are, I kind of that you know, well, the demands in Bitcoin, and 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 mm -hmm. therefore you're going to want to build solutions for Bitcoin, uh, and also that you know the 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 lack of privacy baked into layer one is is a is a feature, not a bug, right? I, I guess it's like, it's not a bug; it's a feature. It's like kind of joke answer, but uh, that is kind of true. So. Um, it's easier or it's, it's probably more suitable to build layers upon Bitcoin, um, mm -hmm. just like there's layers built on the internet, for example, and, um, uh, rather than have everything baked in at the base layer. Um, okay, no, I, I, I think that's a pretty good answer because I remember we spoke to Giacomo Zucco about it and he was somewhat critical of having privacy baked in the base layer, went into quite a good answer about it as well and, and why he saw that as an issue. Um, but, well, but all, people, sorry. the thing that people worship most about Bitcoin is it's you know, 21 million. And I think anything that would potentially damage that is, is probably not going to fly anyway. And, you know, I'm a fan of Monero, but, you know, Monero, we don't, there has been inflation bugs. We don't know if there's one right now. Also, wherever there's a plus, there's a minus. You know, Monero is working well because it has very little volumes. But, you know, potentially having these, you know, very large signatures, which is the way they achieve privacy with the ring signatures, that's potentially a bigger scaling issue than Bitcoin. Yeah, so... Nicholas, I wanted to ask you, why do you think that state or side chains, I'm sorry, side chains uh, haven't really taken off? It's a combination of things, I think. Um, whether you like the other blockchains or not, you know, it's very hard to build on Bitcoin. 
you know, other blockchains, you can get a bunch of inexperienced people to knock up some JavaScript or website and before you know it, you've got a DeFi protocol worth a few million dollars. Bitcoin's hard to build on. I mean, it, it hasn't been easy. When we worked on the side chains, the issue was always exchanges. Exchanges didn't really want to support a Bitcoin side chain. They, they liked running an Ethereum node or, or whatever node. And they are the gatekeepers of, of the ecosystem in a way. And that was the, my experience. I mean, if there was a nice kind of JavaScript type language in, in, a, in, a, in a side chain, could that change things? Maybe. But there were attempts before Ethereum to do this on Bitcoin. If, if you guys remember Counterparty, but they didn't really have the marketing arm of a lot of these other blockchains. I mean, that's, that's of course, let's say it is what it is. But, you know, because I often tell people, well, you know, we had NFTs on Bitcoin before. Do you remember, if you people remember the rare Pepe's, you know, Tev obviously was on Bitcoin before, but for a combination of marketing, uh, user, user tools, and, you know, lack of demand, really, to be honest. Do you think this is, um, because um, lots, lots of the um, crypto exchanges have, Come under skating criticism about the, you know, they don't about how they do not you know really support the Bitcoin ecosystem. Bitcoin ecosystem. They do not you know aside from probably OKX and um, Bitfinex, no other exchange, none of the other exchanges actually support and uh, Lightning Network right now. And you think it's motivated by the fact that uh, you see you mentioned demand, but do you think it's you know driven by greedier business? Quite all right, but you know Bitcoin is what is what actually you know gave birth to this um crypto industry and um there's kind of lack of support don't you think do you think there's a lack of incentive to actually support um liquid side chains like liquid and the rest of them basically just support the bitcoin ecosystem to go like you said they are the gatekeepers why is there lack of interest to actually support the bitcoin ecosystem to grow they they can do it incentives i mean yeah running a node at home is one running production is, is complicated you know you need to have failover disaster recovery I think there's a lot of challenges there. Also, I mean, side chains is an interesting one in that, you know, Bitcoin's, it's, it's, I think we're all on the same page. When it comes to the concept of sound money, it's, 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 it's won that argument. And no one is saying that Bitcoin is not sound money. So maybe Ethereum or Solana, or I don't know what the latest one is, uh, Terra, you know, you could argue and say that they're more or less side chains to Bitcoin. I mean, if wrapped Bitcoin in Ethereum, was that, isn't that 16 billion or something the last time I said? Essentially, they've become Bitcoin sidechains anyway. So, you know, a lot of these DeFi protocols, I think one of them got hacked the other day, was it BadgerDAO? That was a Bitcoin DeFi protocol using wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum. So at a very high level, that is a form of, you know, a form of a sidechain. You may not like the implementation, you may think wrapped Bitcoin is somewhat centralized, maybe it is, but they are a lot of these blockchains which are easier to integrate into exchanges and I dare say exchanges are more incentivized because these site, these uh, blockchains can give them you know, a bunch of tokens, <laughs> but they are essentially operating like Bitcoin sidechains. Bad ones, but you know, as long as they don't try and be sound money, I don't really have an issue with that. Yeah. I'll say the problem is generally money, isn't it? I mean, yeah. EOS has they raise so much money and if you if you if you get ETH or have some ETH thing and then you have a token and then you airdrop it and blah 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 then people get it free and then people are incentivized to spread it on Twitter and tell their friends they get it and then they can sell mm -hmm. it and so that's what it's it's money seems to be the issue when it comes to, to Bitcoin related things. Nicholas, what what's your take on on some of these uh platforms like Stacks or RSK where they're trying to basically mimic what's happening on Ethereum um with Bitcoin? I don't know much about stacks, although I, you know, I did go to a presentation. I mean, I know a lot about, I didn't used to know a lot about rootstock. But I don't think there's much demand. I, I sometimes think rootstock is like the bust, or the RSK is the bastard no one wants. Bitcoiners don't like it because it's, it's doing Ethereum type stuff. The Ethereum guys don't like it because it's working on the Bitcoin blockchain. But yeah, that's what that, that feels like. I, I've not really looked into stacks, to be honest. You know, I think there's, I don't have a problem with, yeah, if Bitcoin is sound money and it's being used as a wrapped Bitcoin in, in, in Ethereum or Solana, whether that's on Ethereum and Solana versus Stacks or Big um, RSK, to me, it doesn't really bother me. I don't think it's a big issue. Are you a maximalist? No, I'm a technologist. Um, no, I'm not. But, we're, we're, but, that, but that's one of the things that's interesting about Bitcoin. You know, you have people like Michael Saylor saying, I don't know, it's property. You've got people like Jack Dorsey who says it's money. 
you know, both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton both hate it. You know, it's 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 whatever you want to make it. I mean, I'm, yeah. I didn't like I didn't like Ethereum when I first got into it when it first came out. So I, I thought it would never scale. It clearly hasn't. That's why they're doing Ethereum version two. But I'm open minded. I think there's some brilliant work going on in Monero, for example. I think that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm asking because. Um... As you probably might be aware, you know, Bitcoin maximalism has come under, you know, intense, you know, scrutiny and criticism recently because they think that it's turning people away. I saw it, um, a thread by, I, I just, you know, remember this as um, Ricardo mentioned um, Stacks, the a tweet from, um, a thread, tweeted a thread from um, Stacks uh, founder, um, Neeb, I think that's his name. And he was, you know, he was, he was like, um, Bitcoin maximalism has outlived its usefulness and it's probably turning, you know, turning people away from it, um, Bitcoin and pushing them to other chains like Ethereum where they go and do all this and fancy NFT and DeFi things. So um, do you agree with that sentiment? Like you mentioned, you're a tech, you're, um, techno maximalist or technologist, you know, in that sense. So do you agree with that kind of sentiment that, you know, maximalism is... It's currently useless as it is. It's it's do, doing more harm than you know, than good. I think it's a bit irrelevant. I mean, <laughs> Twitter's entertainment. Let's be honest. People put things to get engagement, and a, a lot of the guys on Twitter are running podcasts. It's part of their business, you know. And you know, if like, you say something controversial, you're going to get more engagement. Um, yeah, I think one of the issues in crypto is there's a lot of noise in in terms of how many people are building. I was surprised. Yeah, I was surprised when, like for example, Ruben Samsung wrote the, the state chains paper, why no one looked at building it. And people always ask me, who else is building state chains? And no one. And you know, I think the stack stuff. I mean, I looked at it briefly, but I, I think sometimes it. I don't. It doesn't. Yeah, he hasn't been able to get mind share like the Ethereum guys, like the Solana guys, like I don't know, Polkadot guys. I mean, that's just it is what it is. But. I think maximalism, it's interesting because I think, yeah, I was around in the block size war and it clearly was needed because, you know, a bunch of VCs got in a room and wanted to change the, the consensus rules of Bitcoin. And that was ridiculous. You know, it really was. And a lot of that maximum came in from there. But I mean, ultimately, it's just noise on Twitter. Some of the maximalists have reached out to me when, um, you know, we released Mercury, we're very supportive. I mean, you know, Stephen Levera, he invited me to be on his show. He's clearly a Bitcoin maximist. I mean, subject never really came up. He was just asking me about, you know, the technology. And I think, yeah, I'm, I'm quite open that I look at other blockchains. As I said, I think you know, it's technology, but, you know, I think we have to sometimes separate the, the entertainment of Twitter from, from what's being happened. And yeah, I think in another world, if counterparty had been more successful, if they'd have got, you know, things like counterparty, um, what was Tether built on, on the layer? If they'd have had better marketing, if they'd have had VC support that like maybe Ethereum and Tezos had, maybe a lot of these blockchains wouldn't have existed. I mean, I'm open to that, but that hasn't happened. That time has passed. It's time to move on. Since you said that you're very open-minded, what you're currently building with Mercury, can it be done on this Ethereum or it's something that is maybe due to this you know, build of Bitcoin is basically domiciled to Bitcoin as it is? Yeah, I mean, we could build it, but I doubt it we would. I mean, it's... It's hard to think of doing something on Ethereum, for example, without a token. Um, also, I don't think there's a demand for it. Um, one of the reasons why Mercury is quite useful for Bitcoin is because it, it does have a, uh, you know, the scripting language of Bitcoin is, is very rigid. But, you know, wherever there's a negative, there's a positive. Bitcoin's very much ossified, and that's why people trust it as sound money. Um, you know, I don't know what Ethereum is right now. <laughs> I mean, if you read uh, Vitalik's latest blog post, he doesn't know what Ethereum is right now. So the negatives around Bitcoin not changing, being ossified is, is you know, I, in 50, when people ask me what coin to invest in, I say, look, Bitcoin's gonna be around for the next 10 years. Ethereum, I can't answer that question. Maybe the latest kid on the block when it comes to a smart contracting layer, Solana, but I'm pretty sure there's gonna be a better version of that in five years time. Whereas if you're looking at an ossified layer, like, you know, as a, as a hard currency, Bitcoin's clearly won that war and that, that's what it is, yeah. You may make more money buying other coins or have more fun building on other blockchains, but they're, they're much more fluid. You, you, you can't stake something long term on that. So. You sound like a maximalist right now. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, 
I, yeah, with the age of Twitter, everyone wants to label someone. You know, you're a Manx list, you're an appeaser. I don't, I really don't know. I mean, I'm open minded. I play with other stuff. I like playing with technology. I mean, that's, it's like martial arts. I mean, I'm at the age of 40, I decided to learn BJJ and re relearn everything. Yeah. So I'm probably not the best person. Maybe I changed my mind too much. So, well, it's good to, it's good to be open minded, right? Uh, and yeah. to consider alternatives at all times. That's kind of like the way I like to see things like, uh, I, I, I just, as just as you said, if, if people who don't know about crypto ask me about, I'll just say, look, buy Bitcoin. If it's going to be the thing that, you know, sticks around. It's the most, it's the most simple, I guess, in a way. And it works. Yeah. It's correct. Everything functions. It's, you know, it's the way to go. And uh, but obviously I'm like, if you're, if you're a gambler, go ahead and like have a look at some other things if you want to. That's the way I see it. And I guess I like to look at, like look at what's going on elsewhere. Cause you can obviously take ideas from there and you can keep up to date with things and, see what i you know what's floating around what people are interested in because you never know where you might get inspiration um and so, you never know you know what's gonna happen in the world <clears throat> it would make my life easier if everything was bought in bitcoin but i just think that ship may be sailed <laughs> yeah mm. um, and i think nfts are fun i mean i, I mean I've, i have a daughter who loves that stuff but um well i, I did have one <laughs> i did have one i sold it though I, I, when i first this is like ages ago i don't know maybe december or january of this year or December last year I thought that well, the NBA Top Shot packs. So I was like, oh, this is, it's only like six dollars or something, and I made a massive profit as well. So you know, yeah. I mean, before it. before Ethereum came out, I spent more of my time playing with things like Counterparty and Mastercoin and things like that. I thought they were quite interesting and coloured coins, but I've just accepted that that knowledge is useless. It didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> Like it could be that in the in the future the that that knowledge will somehow be relevant, right? Like you'll have a step up on other people. Who knows? Well, I was I just that. recently spoke to John Carvalho, and he was talking about how he's going to be using Omni for his his new uh, company synonym for like tokenization and stuff. So, I mean, I did like Counterparty, but you know, I remember at the time Counter was it. I can't remember either Counterparty or Omni layer was kind of criticized by the they weren't called the Bitcoin Maxis then, but you know, I'd say the Bitcoin hardcore people because they were burning Bitcoin to to create those tokens. So you're always going to get controversy, but. Yeah, I remember seeing reading about that. I think yeah. it was Omni, but I'm not going to say that definitively. Yeah, uh, to, to, to get them, I remember you had to send Bitcoin to a certain burn address. And back then, some people said it was you know, it's evil to burn Bitcoin. Yeah, so you're wasting a precious resource. I remember all that controversy. So. I'm not very purist. Yeah, it's, uh... <laughs> you end up being like, there's no truer Scotsman. You know, who's the most purist? You know, it gets a bit high schoolish. You know? <laughs> Right, so I, I'll be interested to see what further, because obviously uh, I can't remember, I can never remember who said this, but I really like the, the phrase. It was, I think it was some Ethereum DeFi guy or something, but he said uh, in one of his articles, it was like uh, bear market, bull development, bull market, bear development. So it's obviously, well, which like, kind, of, kind of makes sense, right? <laughs> I've always said that Ethereum, I've never been a fan of the protocol, but some of the people building stuff on Ethereum, yeah, there's some good stuff like, I think the ZK roll-up stuff is interesting, although, you know, I don't know if people remember, ZK roll-ups was invented by a Bitcoiner. It was called, someone proposed it around 2012. I think it was Greg Maxwell. It was called Coin Witness. So if you do a search on, for Coin Witness on Bitcoin uh, talk, you'll see that's basically what a ZK roll-up is. Or, was it, yeah, one of the ZK things. So, yeah, there's some interesting stuff, but I think you just have to stay open-minded, not get into religious wars. And, then... and you have to wade through the crap. <laughs> to find the odd, the odd diamond in the rough kind of thing, I think is the way I see it. But um, but no, yeah, I guess the, the 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 crux of it is that it'll be interesting to see uh, if and as we went enter some kind of bear market over the next year or so or a couple of years, um, it'll be interesting to see how things change and and whether you know, how cinnamon goes, which is John Cavallo's project, how how um how your entire project goes, how you know how many people pick up on things and start building things more because it does feel to me as if in the bull market there's a lot less being built um that, that's always the, the, the feeling i get i think maybe there's multiple reasons for that but um yeah so it'll be interesting to see as we as we enter like a downturn even as we enter a downturn in the market at some point um I, i'm kind of excited to see what happens and how things develop and what survives um and i, yeah, I and think I, what you're doing and building will probably survive so uh, yeah, and as i said i think state chains i mean We've built the first release, and you know, obviously, we um, we saw coin swap as 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 a as a as a, as a tool on state chains to make it commercially viable. 
I, I, you know, I'd like to think that maybe there's some use cases that we haven't thought about for stake coins. I mean, you know, may, maybe someone's going to do some sort of NFT virtual open dime on top of the protocol. And I think that's sometimes like when, you know, people ask me, what about Taproot? Well, how's that going to change? And I said, well, after Taproot's implemented, you're going to see, you know, developers come and think of things that no one's thinking about right now. I think that'd be quite interesting. I mean, that's what you can hope for and create, you know, open it up a bit. <laughs> fingers crossed right yeah um well i mean i we're we, we, we're i think we're approaching literally a, an hour um so now is probably a, a good time to to wrap up the conversation i mean um i suppose the the question for for you is, is is there anything you wanted to before we do wrap up is there anything you wanted to say or uh anything you want to promote obviously people can can check out um uh check check out your 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 company um and they can check you on twitter as well um if you want to give any sort of information i guess about that um go ahead yeah, i do I, I do have one last question oh, sorry, uh, sorry. what next uh, like i'm pretty interested with uh with, in mercury right now i'm gonna go back to you know give it a try so what's next can we expect for you know users like me probably retards like me who you know are trying to you know, get into, you know, privacy and what can we expect in the future? I would love you to basically join the state chain torch and uh, get the coin, play with it, maybe do a few swaps and send it on and then, you know, tell us if it's easy to use or not. But, you know, in the state chain torch, you know, one of the things about the state chain torch, people don't realize there's no transaction fee for you. This is all happening off chain. So anyone can uh, download the wallet, you know, find the state chain torch on Twitter and, and, and have a play. But that's, you know, I, I hope that we're kind of, we take the beta logo off our website in the next month. And, you know, we start attracting more users. Um, for us personally, we want to look at ways of integrating Lightning. Clearly, there's, you know, strong momentum on Lightning. And, you know, there's been a lot of debate about how Lightning and state chains can work. You know, and that's where our focus is. And, you know, you know we, we, we're going to be working more and more to make this wallet easier to use so that privacy is not this scary thing. It's not this, uh, you know, a, a lot of people are scared of privacy as well, that, you know, they, they get it wrong and they lose their coins. And I think that's uh, what, what, what we have to do. So, but, but yeah, I, I would like people to download the wallet and join the state chain torch and have some fun. Well, I'll be downloading the wallet straight away after this interview. So <laughs> I, I hope to be able to give you some feedback um, yeah. if I don't get sidetracked by something else. But I'll, uh, I'll try and do that. Or if I don't forget to tell you the feedback, which is usually what happens <clears throat> in these uh, oh. circumstances. <laughs> Not very yeah, be good. brutal. It helps. Remember, you know, my team, are, they're engineers. So that, yeah, they, they use Electrum. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I'm not knocking Electrum, but you know, Electrum was a wallet designed for engineers, not not for not for my mother. Yeah. So. Yeah, I've had my my uh, fair share of Electrum struggles over over time. Uh, so I understand what you're saying. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely check it out and and, and uh, try and re remember to give you some some tips. And I guess to anyone out listening, um, uh, please download Mercury Wallet and give it a try. So mm -hmm. all anyone can ask. Um, if you check it out, just type into Google, uh, and you'll you'll find the wallet. Um, but yeah, I guess is there, is there anything else you want to say at all before we head off? No, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed talking about other things as well. So, uh, it was a nice diverse chat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. It was it was awesome to to have you uh, on the pod, and and it's great to just you know get to understand uh, someone behind uh, you know an important inventation and important idea uh, and the why and the how and and also, just I think definitely you've provided me with a much clearer understanding with some of your analogies as well of like uh, you know how the state chains and coin swaps work. Um, so, and also I guess understanding the difference between coin swap and coin join. Like I, I felt like I knew some of like the differences, but now I it feels a lot clearer um, mm -hmm. as to to what the drive is and and the trade offs or reasons are for for going one or the other. So it's much appreciated. Um, but yeah, thanks obviously, uh, Jerry for popping in. Um, sorry to, uh, didn't, I didn't introduce you in the beginning, <laughs> but, uh, for anyone listening, it's cause he wasn't here at the beginning, but he popped in and, and thanks to, uh, Ricardo as well, as always for, for joining and yeah, thanks so much, Nicholas. It's been amazing to, to have you on today and it's been much appreciated and hopefully, uh, once you guys out of beta and, uh, you know, things move further along, um, then we can have you back in the future at, at some time. Um, but un until then it's been great. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, we love you. Have a wonderful day, hour, week, month, year, life. Uh, and uh, we'll see you all next time. And keep buying Bitcoin. Bitcoin.